Welcome back to Hover Unboxed. Today I've got a Radeon RX 6600 XT roundup for you as we've now got eight models on hand so I thought why not check them all out. Now I don't necessarily recommend buying a graphics card at the moment if you can help it but I realize there are some of you who simply need something right now and are willing to take the pricing pain to get gaming. Plus we have no idea when pricing and availability will improve. We could very well be faced with the same situation in a year's time and God forbid it could get even worse. But as bad as pricing and availability is of the 6600 XT right now, it is actually as good as it gets, at least here in Australia. We have multiple 6600 XT models available for between $750 and $800 Australian, and that's pretty good given the other side of the aisle is offering a GTX 1660 Super for the same money. Or you can have a lovely GTX 1050 Ti for $450 Australian. I think I threw up a little bit in my mouth there, so sorry about that. Anyway, if you are unfortunate enough to need a graphics card right now and you're not interested in a GT710, the 6600 XT really is your best option. And assuming that you're lucky enough to have a few options available to you, which one should you purchase? Well, we already know you should avoid the Biostar RX 6600 XT gaming at all costs, but there are several other models that I'm yet to check out, so let's go over each one and then jump into the benchmark data. We'll start by looking at Power Colors Hellhound, and this is a model that I expect will be one of the most popular. It is quite a compact card, though unfortunately it's not a dual slot design, as the plastic fan shroud does intrude on the third slot, with a total card width of 45mm. As for the other dimensions, the Hellhound measures just 216mm long and 132mm tall, so it's certainly one of the smaller 6600 XTs that you're going to come across. In total, the card weighs 752 grams, which is quite heavy for a card of this size. Then in terms of cooling, there's a pair of 100 millimeter translucent fans with blue LED lighting, though if blue doesn't work for you, there is a switch to disable the lighting altogether. On the backside, you'll find a full-size aluminum backplate with the Hellhound logo, which is also backlit with blue LEDs. Then along the leading edge of the card, so the edge that faces outside when traditionally mounted, there's a dual bias switch, which is a really nice feature to include. And there's also the LED switch and then an 8-pin PCIe power input. As for the cooler, Power Color has included three nickel-plated copper heat pipes, which are used to extract heat from the nickel-plated copper base and then move it through the many aluminum fins. It's a very solid looking design that should work very well. Now, if you've got a bit more money to spend, PowerColor's offering their Red Devil model, which is basically a hellhound on steroids. You're still getting two 100 millimeter fans, but everything else has been upgraded. As a result, the weight has increased by 33% to 998 grams. In terms of dimensions, the Red Devil is longer at 251 millimeters and wider at 54 millimeters, but still stands 132 millimeters tall. Basically, those dimensions allow for the accommodation of a much larger heatsink, which includes four 6mm copper heat pipes. The lighting effects have also been upgraded with RGB LEDs, and of course, the dual bias functionality remains. The power input has also been beefed up with the addition of a 6-pin PCIe power input alongside the standard 8-pin input, and the VRM has been upgraded from a 6 plus 2 phase design to 8 plus 2. The plastic fan shroud also looks much more premium as it is now wrapped in aluminium trimmings and the rear backplate also looks a bit more serious. I should note in terms of display connectivity though, the Hellhound and Red Devil are identical, offering a single HDMI 2.1 output and three display port outputs. Next up we have Sapphire with their Pulse model and right away I've got to say they win the award for the cutest packaging. The box is about a half the size of most other 6600 XT boxes and frankly I have no idea what other brands feel the need to make the box significantly larger than its contents. Anyway, the Pulse is a smart looking card and like the Hellhound it does appear very compact, though just like the Hellhound it does require more than two slots, measuring 45 millimeters wide. Lengthwise, it's slightly shorter than the Red Devil at 240 millimeters, and in terms of height, it's also shorter than both the Power Color models at just 120 millimeters tall. Sapphire appear to be sticking to their tradition of making a lightweight graphics card with the Pulse, tipping the scales at just 605 grams, making it 20% lighter than the Hellhound, which is quite a sizable difference. You still get a reasonably thick aluminum backplate, though it is worth noting that the dual bias support isn't on offer here, and Sapphire has gone with a standard I.O. configuration. 
As for cooling, you get a pair of 90 millimeter fans, so slightly smaller than the fans used by PowerColor, with a very modest looking heatsink that utilizes three nickel plated copper heat pipes and a copper base plate. There is just a single heatsink and it's used to cool not just the GPU, but also the GDDR6 memory and the VRM components. And this is really quite typical of a 6600 XT cooler. Moving on to ASUS, and we have the ROG Strix version of the 6600 XT, but they also offer a dual edition as well, which I assume is the base model, but ASUS didn't supply that card despite us asking for it, and unfortunately I was unable to buy it. And I should note that this was also the case with MSI and their Ventus version. Sadly, with the industry the way it is right now, we can only review a very limited number of products, so the Ventus and Dual have managed to escape our testing for now. It's probably worth mentioning that right now, the Strix and Dual models appear to almost share the exact same price point, so that being the case, you'd probably just buy the more premium Strix version anyway. And what you get here is Dual 95mm Axial Tech fans, capped off with a super fancy looking plastic shroud that's dressed in aluminium trimmings. Then around on the backside, ASUS has included a full-size aluminium backplate with a few ROG decals. As you'd expect from a premium Strix model, dual bias support is on offer here, though ASUS has gone with just a single 8-pin PCI power input and the standard I.O. configuration. Now size-wise, the card measures 243mm long, so pretty standard when compared to what we've seen so far. Height-wise, it is slightly oversized, standing 134mm tall, and it's quite wide, taking up three slots at 52 millimeters. It's also quite heavy for what is really a compact graphics card, weighing in at 835 grams, though that does make it 16% lighter than the power color Red Devil. Overall though, an impressive looking 6600 XT, and I'm keen to see how it performs. Next, we have the MSI Gaming X model, and this was the card that we used for our day one review, and it worked exceptionally well. It is a fairly typical looking Gaming X themed card, just in a compact 6600 XT form. The card stretches 270 millimeters long, stands 130 millimeters tall, and is 51 millimeters thick. It also weighs in at 886 grams, so slightly heavier than the ASUS Strix, and slightly less than the Power Color Red Devil. Like all models that we've looked at so far though, the Gaming X version does use just two fans, and MSI has gone with a pair of their Torx Fan 4.0 fans, which measure 90 millimeters in diameter. The plastic fan shroud looks quite cool, and I really like the aluminium backplate, which features some cutouts that allow air to pass through, though that is something that's quite commonplace now. Another common feature is dual BIOS support, and unfortunately, MSI has missed this common and really crucial feature, especially for a premium graphics card. So the Gaming X does not include a dual BIOS, which is a real shame. MSI is also stuck with the standard I.O. configuration, and feeding power into the card is a single 8-pin PCIe power connector. Overall, it's a pretty standard looking 6600 XT, with perhaps the exception of the hunking great cooler MSI slapped on, featuring two large arrays of aluminium fins and three nickel-plated copper heat pipes, which extract heat from the nickel-plated copper base, and then transfer it through the many fins. So the Gaming X should perform very well, it's just a shame the feature list isn't a little more impressive. Now, XFX is bucking the trend of compact dual fan coolers with the Speedster Merc 308 by including three 80mm fans for a total card length of 270mm, so 11% longer than the MSI Gaming X model. That said, it's not excessively wide at 50mm, though it will take up three slots. It also measures 118mm tall, which is a fairly standard height for a full-size graphics card. Weight-wise, it's up there with the heaviest at 896 grams, so basically the same weight as the Gaming X. However, unlike MSI and their Gaming X card, XFX has graced the Speedster Merc 308 with dual BIOS functionality, so that is great to see. Design-wise, the Merc, in my opinion, looks great. I really like how the fan shroud is encased in aluminium, and the silver trimmings that wrap around both sides look really good. The full-length aluminium backplate also wraps around the far end of the card, and this ensures that the Merc looks really impressive from all angles. Also, the edge lit XFX and Radeon logos look great, and are a very cool addition in my opinion, and this is probably the best looking 6600 XT once it's installed in your case. As for cooling, the Merc also looks very promising, with a full-length aluminium finned heatsink, riddled with four nickel-plated copper heat pipes, 
that extend out the left and right sides of the nickel plated copper base, which has been used to cool both the GPU and GDDR6 memory. So what we have is another 6600 XT that should perform very well in our thermal testing. Then last up we have the Gigabyte Gaming OC, which is another triple fan card, though this one's even longer at 282mm, despite using 80mm fans. Width-wise though, it is the same at 50mm, and the height is also roughly the same at 115mm. Given those dimensions, it probably won't surprise you to learn that it also weighs a similar amount to that of the MSI Gaming X and XFX Speedster Merc at 837 grams. Now, Gigabyte only offers two versions of the 6600 XT, and both use a triple fan cooler, with the alternate option being the Eagle version. Now, I have no idea how the gaming OC is meant to be priced relative to the Eagle, but it probably doesn't matter right now. What I can tell you is the gaming OC is pretty basic, with no extra features such as dual BIOS support. You just get a standard 8-pin PCIe power input, and then the standard I.O. configuration with the triple fan cooler. But even the cooler is pretty basic with three direct touch copper heat pipes, so there's no copper base here, and the heat pipes aren't nickel plated. The card should work well enough though, but it's certainly a much more simplistic approach than what we've seen from others. Okay, so we've briefly looked at each of the models that we'll be testing, now it's time to get into the results. Before we do though, please note that all cards were tested inside an enclosed system in a standard horizontal orientation. The case used is the Corsair Obsidian Series 500D, and then inside we have the Ryzen 9 5950X test CPU, which was cooled using the Corsair IQ Elite Capelix all-in-one liquid cooler, which was front-mounted and therefore dumped heat into the case. Also, please note all testing was conducted in a 21 degree room, and I've provided out-of-the-box thermal results as well as 40 decibel noise normalized testing. Okay, let's get into the results. Starting with out of the box GPU hotspot temperatures, we see that the power color Red Devil performs exceptionally well, peaking at just 74 degrees, making it a degree cooler than the ASUS ROG Strix, which was running at a much higher 2000 RPM fan speed and was generating noticeably more noise. Then we have the MSI Gaming X, which was reported to be running 6 degrees hotter, but with an 1100 RPM fan speed, it was so quiet that I couldn't actually accurately measure the operating volume. The Power Color Hellhound was also exceptionally good, and while the Gigabyte Gaming OC also looked quite impressive at 81 degrees, note that we're looking at an almost 2000 RPM fan speed for that model. Then we have the XFX Speedster Merc 308, which was extremely quiet, though the hotspot did reach 90 degrees, which is still perfectly acceptable, but probably not quite as good as what I was expecting from this model. The Sapphire Pulse was comparatively much better, also hitting 90 degrees, but with a significantly lower fan speed and therefore ran much quieter. Then finally we have the disaster that is the Biostar Gaming, which was not only the hottest card, but also by far the loudest. For those of you interested, here are the GPU edge temperatures. When compared to the hotspot temperatures, the edge temperatures are not only much lower, but they do also mix up the standings as the ASUS Strix model is now the coolest and by a 4 degree margin. That said, power colour still looks great here with the Red Devil and Hellhound picking up the second and third spots respectively. Now, with all eight models normalised to 40 decibels, this is how they compare, and I should note that the quietest I was able to get the Biostar gaming card was 42 decibels, and here it hit 106 degrees, so that is a clear fail for this test. The rest of the field though was quite evenly matched with no more than a 12 degree variance between the best and worst models. The best examples being the MSI Gaming X and Power Color Red Devil, both of which peaked at just 70 degrees. The Power Color Hellhound was also excellent at 71 degrees, and quite shockingly that meant it was 4 degrees cooler than the ASUS Strix which peaked at 75 degrees. So still a great result there, but you'd probably expect a Strix card to beat the Hellhound. The XFX Speedster Merc and Sapphire Pulse did reasonably well. They were, after all, just 8 degrees hotter than the best performing models, so certainly an acceptable result there. Then we have the Gigabyte Gaming OC at 82 degrees, which was the worst result of the partner cards outside of the Biostar model. Still, 82 degrees is very much a pass, but there were numerous better performing options, which doesn't bode particularly well for Gigabyte. The standings are fairly similar when looking at the edge temperatures. The Power Color Red Devil nudges a few degrees lower than the MSI Gaming X, which peaked at 57 degrees, and that's where it matched the ASUS Strix and Power Color Hellhound. Again, the XFX Speedster wasn't too far behind, nor was the Sapphire Pulse. And although the Gigabyte Gaming OC was the worst of the big players, the results were still very acceptable. 
So there you have it. That's how these Radeon RX 6600 XT board partner cards compare. And while we weren't able to get our hands on every single last one of them, I think this is a pretty good sample of cards. Now, if you're confused why I didn't include any gaming benchmarks, it's because they're a complete waste of runtime. The performance difference between the AMD base spec and the absolute fastest factory overclock 6600 XT is 4% on average, and perhaps I'll provide an example of that. So rather than show multiple gaming graphs of eight 6600 XT models all delivering the exact same or virtually the same FPS figures, I'm just gonna tell you that they're all virtually the same. Performance is irrelevant between these various models. Yeah, they're all much the same. On that note, overclocking each model is also a complete waste of my time, and worse still, it'd probably end up being quite misleading. Overclocking headroom will vary from one model to the next, even within the same product line, as the key differentiating factor here isn't power delivery or cooling performance, but rather the silicon quality. So a sample size of one is misleading at best, and even with a dozen versions of each model, I'd probably only be testing batch quality. Also, if you're wondering why I haven't included VRM and GDDR6 thermal data, it's because all cards run those components at very low temperatures, even the BioStar model. The fact is eight gigabytes of 16 gigabits per second GDDR6 memory doesn't get very hot at all, and only requires very basic cooling, which all models provide. Moreover, the reference power delivery, which all models are obligated to at least meet, is ample for the requirements of the 6600 XT. So again, these components only require very basic cooling, and this means all models run the VRM components and memory chips well within spec. Having said all of that, all models, with the exception of the BioStar gaming version, run the GPU well within the temperature specification while generating very little noise. So again, with the exception of BioStar, there's no bad products here. Of course, the best examples were the MSI Gaming X, Power Color Red Devil, and Hellhound, but they were really only a few degrees cooler than the Asus Strix, which was only a few degrees cooler than the Sapphire Pulse, XFX Speeds to Merc, and Gigabyte Gaming OC. Therefore, my preference would be for either the Power Color Red Devil or Hellhound with the MSI Gaming X as a backup, simply because it doesn't offer dual bar support. All of that said, if you are limited to the Sapphire Pulse or Gigabyte Gaming OC, I certainly wouldn't view that as a major issue. So the good news is for the most part, you can't go wrong with your 6600 XT purchase, at least if you're buying one of the MSI, PowerColor, ASUS, XFX, Sapphire or Gigabyte models tested here. And that is going to do it for this video. If you enjoyed it, give it a thumbs up. You can also subscribe for more content. And if you'd like to become a Harbour Box community member, then you can sign up at Floatplane or Patreon. The links for those are in the video description. Uh, we will get you access to stuff like our exclusive Discord server where you can chat with Tim and myself. We're in there pretty much on a daily basis. Uh, we do a live stream every month. So Tim and I get together and answer your questions live and talk about whatever interesting things have happened throughout the month behind the scenes content, Q and A's, a lot of cool stuff there. So if you're interested, check it out. But if not, perfectly fine. And I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.